So as Kevin said, this is a novel set in the past, and actually it's set in partly in this neighborhood. So what I'm going to read tonight um, is actually set on Polk Street. So the novel actually tells two stories. Uh, the first story is of uh, a man named Bill Ryan who comes to San Francisco in 1971 uh, as an 18-year-old when he's kicked out of his family um, for being gay, um, given $200, taken to the bus stop, to the bus station and told to get lost. Uh, he ends up in San Francisco because he's been told that's where the gay people are. And so part of the novel follows his trajectory to 1984 when he dies, apparently of an accidental asphyxiation caused by a gas leak in his apartment. The second part of the novel starts in 1984 with Henry Rios, who is uh, three months out of rehab and desperate for work, agrees to uh, take part-time work as a death claims investigator for the insurance company that insured Bill Ryan. And his first case is to investigate the death of the apparently accidental death of Bill Ryan, um, which he concludes, you know, wasn't accidental. Um, so uh, and so the story the story alternates chapters between Bill's story and Henry's story, and um, you know mayhem ensues. So <laughs> I'm actually going to read uh, Bill's story rather than Rios's story. So a little background. So in this chapter, uh, Bill has arrived in San Francisco. It's June 1971. He's 18 years old. He gets off at the Greyhound bus station, which used to be down on 5th, I think. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. It's fiction, folks. <clears throat> yes, on 7th, as I was saying. <clears throat> and uh, he's, he's uh, you know, he's, he's not a happy boy. Um, Another gay boy who was on the bus with him tells him to go to Polk Street because that's where the gays are. So Bill is looking for Polk Street. And he's looking for the gays. So Polk Street, Polk Street. Bill committed the name to memory as he stood on the sidewalk beneath a web of low line electrical wires over streetcars ferrying passengers up and down an immense boulevard just as they did in the rice -roni commercials. He peered up a street called Powell and saw in the distance a cable car chugging up a steep incline and heard in his head and the little cable cars climb halfway to the stars. For a moment his anxiety fell away and he was charmed. If only he thought it wasn't so frigging cold. The envelope his mother had given him had $200 in it. He spent 50 on the bus fare, another 10 on food, potato chips, candy bars, and Cokes, leaving him with $140. He left 50 in the suitcase he stowed in the locker at the bus station. The remaining 90 was his stake, to pay for food and a place to stay. He saw a little diner on a narrow street off Powell and ducked into it as evening began to settle in the sky and the street lamps flickered on. The diner was furnished with ratty booths and table on a grimy tiled floor. No amount of mopping would ever get clean. Beneath harsh fluorescent lights, the air was thick with grease and cigarette smoke and curses from the cooks in the kitchen behind the counter. A Chinaman brought him a fly speck menu from which he ordered a hamburger, fries, and a Coke. As he had wandered around the city, he had pondered how to find Polk Street. He was afraid to ask anyone because it would expose him as a queer, but he didn't care what the Chinaman thought. So when he returned with Bill's food, Bill said, my friend lives on Polk Street. Do you know where that is? Polk? When you leave here, take a left and keep walking till you see City Hall. Polk Street runs right in front of it. You want anything else? Amazed by the Chinaman's fluency in English, <laughs> Bill said, no, thank you. Wait. What does City Hall look like? Like a big wedding cake. You can't miss it. <laughs> the waiter was right. 
In the fading light, City Hall looked like an immense domed cake. He was standing in front of it on Polk Street, but while he had found the street, he didn't know in which direction to go to find the queers, he thought. I'm looking for the queers because... But before he could complete the sentence in his head, someone said, I'm a queer. The sound startled him. He looked around to see who had spoken, but he was quite alone. And then he realized it was his own voice he had heard. His own voice saying aloud the words it had said in his head a thousand times, but which until that moment had never passed his lips. I'm a queer, he said again. He waited for the ground to open up beneath him and tumble him into hell, or a bolt of lightning to incinerate him, but all he heard was the traffic noises and the rustle of the wind. Then once more, softly but with utter conviction, he said, I'm a queer. For a moment it seemed to him the world stopped. The cars and buses froze in place. The men in suits exiting City Hall were suspended in mid-step. Even the wisps of pink and orange and lavender in the evening sky paused in their unfurling. All he heard was his heart beating in his ears. All he felt was the heft of his own flesh as the magnitude of the revelation. I'm a queer. Settled into the very cells that composed him because he was a queer and that changed everything. I'm a... Uh, he stopped himself. Queer was an epithet of contempt and loathing, and it would no longer do. What had the hippie boy called him? I'm a uh, gay, Bill said. That sounded not quite right, so he tried again. I'm gay. The world spun back into place. We pause now while the camera adjust, cameraman adjusts. <laughs> Ready? Okay. It was nearly midnight. Bill had discovered the part of Polk Street where, among shoe repair shops and newsstands, were bars which seemed patronized entirely by men. Some of the men matched descriptions he'd read in the abnormal psychology textbooks of his hometown library, willowy, swishy figures in feminine clothes with elaborately styled bouffants giggling and mincing. They were as repulsive to him in the flesh as they had been in print, but their presence, like neon lights, signaled to him that he was in the right place. Had it not been for these creatures, he might not have been sure, because the other men going in and out of the bars looked normal to Bill. Some were in business suits, while others wore Levi's and leather jackets or polyester pants and Hawaiian shirts or tie-dyed tees and bell-bottoms. He saw slender hippie boys and old white-haired pot-bellied grandpas and middle-aged men who looked like they mowed the lawn on Saturday afternoon and then settled in front of the TV with a six-pack to watch the game, just like his dad. At first he found it hard to believe these ordinary-looking men were gay. After observing them for a few cold hours, however, he noticed, even among the most normal-looking of them, small, delicate mannerisms, as they walked by, the twist of a hand, the toss of a head, or heard in their ordinary, otherwise ordinary voices the faintest sibilance. These gestures and inflections signaled to him that these men were not, after all, like his father or his brothers. They moved differently than the men of Eden Plains, Illinois. More loosely, more softly, their maleness was undeniable, but it was also less insistent. And here and there among them strode a few men more beautiful than any males he had ever seen outside the pages of magazine ads or the movie screen. The beauties were, in their way, as distinctive as the squishes. And like the squishes, they carried themselves as if they were on display. They seemed to feel like actors, their every step and gesture more controlled and a little more emphatic than in ordinary life. 
as if in response to the commands of an unseen director. His heart broke a dozen times that night as he followed them with dazed and dazzled eyes they were so magnificent and so utterly inaccessible. More than a few men slowed when they saw him propped against the wall next to a pet store and gave him long, lingering looks, their eyes making a slow, shameless appraisal of his face and his body from the top of his head to the cuffs of his <coughs> Levi's. The attention excited and embarrassed him, forcing his eyes to the ground where he shuffled his feet on the dirty sidewalk, hoping that someone would speak to him, but no one did. Finally, cold and tired, but electric with arousal, he screwed up his courage and pushed through the doors of a bar he had already passed half a dozen times. Mounted above the padded double doors was a neon mask, and also spelled out in neon were the words, the hide and seek. He was overwhelmed by the warm air scented with cigarette smoke, beer, and cologne. In the dim reddish light, he made out a long bar where clusters of men gathered around stools, talking and laughing. There was a scattering of tables on the main floor and a long shelf against the back wall where other men stood mostly in silence, beers in hand, scanning the room purposefully. Rod Stewart sang Maggie May on the flashing Wurlitzer jukebox. Apart from the absence of women, the bar seemed not much different than the college bar his brother Matt had snuck him into when Bill had visited him in Urbana. He had only taken a step toward the bar when a big hand pressed his chest, stopping him, and a deep voice rumbled, Let's see some ID, kid. The man was broad-shouldered and muscular in a tight black t-shirt and jeans, but his bearded face was not unfriendly. Um, I just got here from Chicago, Bill said, hoping that name-dropping another big city would get him past the bouncer. Yeah, well, welcome to California, but I still need to see ID. Drinking age here is 21. <coughs> Bill pulled his wallet out of his pocket and handed the man his driver's license, still hoping for a break. The man sighed. You know I can't let you in, Bill. Cops are always looking for a reason to shut us down. Can't have any underage drinking. What if I just get a Coke, Bill said, encouraged that the man had called him by his name. No miners on the premises, that's the law. You can hang out with me for a few minutes to warm up, then you have to leave. He returned Bill's license to him. So, he continued conversationally, how long have you been in the city? This afternoon. The man did the double take. Wow, fresh meat. Stay here and don't move. Oh, I'm Pete. Pete went to the bar and talked briefly to a handsome bartender who glanced at Bill, nodded, and smiled. He reached down to the bar, got a glass, and filled it, then handed it to Pete, who returned to his station. Have a Coke on the house, kid, Pete said, handing him the cold glass. So, what brings you out here, school? Bill thanked him for the Coke and considered how much to tell him. Yeah, uh, school, he said, uncertainly. Bill replied with a skeptical, uh-huh. Where are you staying? Um, I don't know yet. Are there any cheap motels around here? Bill frowned. Are you a runaway kid? The question dissolved his fragile confidence and sudden tears burned his eyes. In an unsteady voice, he said, um, my family, um, I had to leave because he got no further and started to cry. Bill took the glass from him, set it down and bear hugged him. Hey, Bill, it's going to be okay. Your folks found out you're gay and threw you out. Is that what happened? Not trusting himself to speak, Bill nodded. That is fucked up. You don't have a place to stay tonight, right? No, Bill said, wondering whether Pete was about to offer him a bed. The thought was both frightening and exciting. Okay, wait here. I know someone who can help you. Slightly that down, he watched Pete disappear into the crowd while he sipped his coke. A moment later, the bouncer emerged, followed by another man, a boy, really, who did not seem much older than Bill. He was tall and stick-thin. His trousers were spray-painted tight, and he wore a long-sleeved, blouse-like white shirt, buttons undone to reveal a pale, hairless chest. He sashayed toward Pete, behind Pete, stopping to greet friends with a flip of his wrist. 
His flame red hair came to a brittle point above his forehead. As he approached, Bill saw traces of mascara ringing the boy's bright blue eyes and smelled a gardenia scented perfume. He was horrified. Switch position. <laughs> <laughs> This is my good side. <laughs> here's our stray, Bill said to the boy when they reached Bill Pete said that here's our stray, Pete said to the boy when they reached Bill. Bill, this is Waldo. He said you could crash at his place tonight. Well, hello, Bill, Waldo trilled, his voice surprisingly deep. You are fresh off the farm, aren't you? Hi. Bill mumbled. I'm going to leave you two boys to talk, Pete said, stepping back to his post. Waldo smiled and looked Bill over. Although there was nothing carnal in Waldo's appraisal, Bill felt more exposed under the other boys' bright gaze than he had under the stares of the men on the street. Are you afraid I want to get into your pants, Waldo asked. Because, hon, let me tell you right off the bat, I'm not into twinks at all. Pete says you need a place to crash, and that's what I got, plus some soup if you're hungry. It's late, and Mom is tired, and I have work tomorrow, so are you coming? Um, I don't know. Suit yourself, hon, Waldo said kindly. You can come with me or hit the streets, but I gotta tell you, things get pretty ugly out there after last call. Your choice. The weight of the long day and all its strangeness and anxieties Sights and sounds came crashing down on Bill. Exhausted and desperate, he said to the swishy boy, Okay, I'll go with you. Smart boy, let me get my wrap and we'll be off. Thank you, Cecil. Cecil be the doodle. <laughs> Um, so, what should we do? We could talk, I could read some more. What do you want? Read some more. Really? Ah, I thought. I can read. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll do questions and then if there's time, I'll finish that little section. Um, can I have my phone? I just need to keep track of the time. Do you have a question? I do. Thank um, you. It's nice that there's another Henry Rios since I'm finally getting around to reading. <laughs> um, but I was really at, wanted to ask you about the um, the Mexico City book. Uh huh. And whether indeed there will be another one. Well, um, that's the plan. No, no pressure. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, that's the plan. So um, I just got the rights back to City of Palaces from um, the publisher. And um, now that I have the rights back, I feel more enthusiastic about writing a sequel. So I do expect at some point that I will write a sequel. It's really good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm curious. Um, you may be mistaken, but I think you, you went for a political office at one point somewhere in the valley. Is that correct? No, I ran for judge here. Oh, for judge here. Mm -hmm. And you didn't get it. Mm -hmm. um, are you still interested in, in something along that line? Or? No. <laughs> That's funny you should ask. Um, a couple of days ago, a friend of mine who's uh, active in the political scene called me and said, Hey, are you interested in running for judge again? And I said, uh, absolutely not. So Now I'm, I've retired from the law. I'm done with the law. 30, 30 years is long enough. Yes. Do the greatest stories from the day of office you write? Uh, they, um, so, uh, what, so what I do at this point, because I've written so many of them, is I write uh, like a two or three page synopsis just to give myself the trajectory of the story, and then I just start writing it. Um, yeah, pretty much at this point, they tell themselves, they, it tells itself, the stories tell themselves. Do I think about the readers? Yeah. Um, not really. I mean, 
I think about the readers in this sense, which is I, I write a particular kind of novel, mostly mystery. So mystery readers expect a puzzle, and um, you know that's part of the fun of reading mysteries. I'm a mystery reader myself, so I do try to do that to to engage readers that way. And um, no matter how somber the subject matter of my books, I you know I, I'm a big believer that. Um, Fiction should be entertaining at some level. It should be compelling, let's say. It should keep the reader interested. Um, so, you know, when I'm writing, I try to do that with with my particular particular style of prose I write. It's not, uh, you know, I I'm not um, I'm not a difficult writer to read, and that's intentional. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Hi. Hi. Who are some of your favorite mystery authors to read, and who are your role models for that may or may not be? Um. So. So, uh, I would say you know the the biggest the two, the two mystery writers who are my biggest influences are quite opposite in some ways. Um, the first was Raymond Chandler because he's just of his distinctive style and because he kind of invented, he and Dashiell Hammett kind of invented American noir. Although I understand he's quite a problematic writer. <laughs> um, the Long Goodbye, though, I think is my favorite book, which is a book in which his hero Marlowe falls in love with another man. Um, it's, uh, and then the other a mystery writer who sort of gave me permission to write mysteries was Joseph Hansen. Joseph Hansen, who started, whose first book was published in 1971, was the first gay male writer uh, who enjoyed, you know, sort of popular success with his uh, hero, David Branstetter, who was an insurance investigator. In fact, the fact, in fact, you know, Rios taking on the job as an insurance investigator in this book is sort of my homage to Joe. Um, so actually right now I, I'm a judge for the Los Angeles Times Book Award in the mystery thriller category. So I've you been are a judge. Yeah. <laughs> a literary judge. So I've been reading for the last three months, I read dozens of mysteries. And um, I have to say, you know, the best ones uh, tend to be women writers, interestingly. There are a lot of women of color writing. Um, although I just finished reading Michael Conley, who's an old school. His new book is fantastic. It's really kind of a master lesson in how to write that particular kind of um, old school mystery. This is the one when the boss was a woman? Yes, yeah, so it's called The Night Flyer. It just came out. It's interesting though, I mean, so I'm one of three judges. The other two judges are women. One of them is an African-American woman, so we've got like all the bases covered. <laughs> and um, mystery writing is a lot more diverse now than it was when my first book was published in 1986, although there's still not very many queer writers. And those who exist are mostly published by small presses. But. Um, yeah, it's kind of a golden age for for uh, diversity in mysteries. I like Hanson. He was really good. Who? Hanson. Yes, I just talked about him. Joe Hanson? He um, had this father, and he was head of the insurance company. Right. He won a little line to keep that home. Right. right. Yes. Someone is reprinting the right. Thing. Yeah, I wrote a big essay about Joe Hansen, which appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books online, so, because I knew him. But he was married to a woman, right? Jane, who was a lesbian. <laughs> it, was, it was complicated. <laughs> and it comes out in some of his soft porn novels where you can tell they're based on their relationship. I don't, I don't think I've ever read Joe's soft porn novels. <laughs> I read the one he wrote as a woman that's set in the an antebellum south. <laughs> yes. Did you have to do much research on the Fulton Street neighborhood? I did. In the 70s, since it no longer exists, were 
record. I did, and I spent a lot of time at the uh, Historical Society archive, um, and I spent a lot of time here looking at photos. So the cover of this book is a photograph um, that I found in the archive up here. I forget, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the uh, photographer. Uh, he was a man who um, who took picture, who took photographs at Polk Street and Castro Street from the early 70s to um, when he died. He was a friend of Harvey Milk's and he left his archive to the library. So I went up there and I spent an afternoon looking and I found this photograph, which is actually of a young man standing outside of a bar on Polk Street. Um, this is what I sent to my, my book cover designer to use. But yeah, that neighborhood is gone, so I did have to spend a fair amount of time trying to re recreate it. But I, I kind of remember it because, you know, I'm old. But <laughs> like most of you, I'm, I'm a man of a person of mature years, so I actually kind of remember that. Yes. So just a comment. I, uh, you made mention of the somber nature of some of your work, and I, I read your books way back when they first came out, and I haven't really gone back to them. But I remembered them as being quite dark and complex. And I was just, while I was waiting, I was rereading a part of Golden Boy, and I thought, God, how witty you are. You're really very funny sometimes. And one of the quotes I, I loved it, you talk about Kubler Ross, and then one of the characters says, Forget about Kubler Ross. There's only two stages of death: alive and dead. Which, you know, <laughs> Thank you for saying good. that. So, <laughs> I go back and read them. Thanks. I'm republishing them all with my own through my own press. So. So you got the rights back. Yes, I did. Uh, I got the rights back a couple of years ago, and I've just been going through each one of them individually and doing a little revision. And. Um, republishing them. So, are you going to write more Rio's books? A couple more. That are in the uh, insert between all the other ones? Mm -hmm. Well, the next one will follow this book, set in Los Angeles in 1987 or 8. Okay. And, then the, and then I want to bring him, I want to bring Rio's into the present, you know, where he's in his late 60s. And so, you know, that's my plan. So, why have you decided to self-publish? So, um, you know, I've had all the experiences you can have as a writer, I, but the original books were published by a small publisher. Um, I, I, yeah, Allison. Allison, yeah. Um, and then I was published by Harper. Harper Collins, and then by Putnam, and then the paperbacks were published by Ballantyne. So then I had the big publishing experience. Um, and what happens is uh, you give up so much control as a writer. Uh, and I am at a point in my life where I want control of my work. It's my legacy. So when the license, so um, the books were being kept in print by a big international media corporation called Open Road Media. And when our five-year licensing um, contract expired, they wanted to extend it, and I said, I, I want the rights back. And so that's why I want to control my work. And I especially want to control the rights to my work, because you give that up when you publish with the publisher. They have the rights, and now with print on demand and ebooks they can claim the rights in perpetuity because generally, you know, they keep the rights as long as the books are in print. Well nowadays the books are theoretically in print forever, so it would be very difficult for I, mean, I just had this fight with uh, the University of Wisconsin press over City of Palaces. Um, I basically had to buy the rights back to that book because they said, well, you know, the book's still technically in print. Yes. Would you be open to having any of your um, books turned into a screen yet at that stage? So actually the books have been uh, under option from a production company for the last couple of years. And um, they still are until March of this year. Uh, it's a company called Working Title Productions. So they've had, you know, for the last two years, 
that they, when you had the option, they send me a check and, <laughs> and then nothing happens, but that's Hollywood, right? So <laughs> presumably they, they're trying to make something happen, but uh, uh, we'll know. The, so this, this option expires at the end of March, and then we'll see if they renew it or what happens. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Are there any um, contemporary LGBT mystery writers here at Canada? Um, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just starting to, to read LGBT mystery writers. There's a, there are a couple of trans writers I like. Renee James, uh, who's a trans woman, and, and Dharma Kelleher. So I'm very interested in their work. Um, so it's 642. Huh? I was curious if you've read anything by Reginald Hill. I love Reginald Hill. Your very uh, child's play, which because he, he weaves in a gay character that has pretty dominant. Uh, Sergeant Weldy. Yeah, Weldy. Right. yeah, no, I love Reginald Hill. Yeah, he's fun. Um, why don't I just read the end of that scene to you, okay? And then we'll call it a day. Thank you all for coming. So we, as we left off, they were um, Bill and Waldo were going to Waldo's house, Waldo's apartment. Okay. Waldo lived in a three-story brick tenement in the garbage-strewn Alley Street off Polk. He unlocked first an iron gate and then a glass door to let them into a tiny foyer with a dirty black and white checkerboard floor. On one wall were mailbox slots, and on the other were signs warning the residents against this or that violation of building rules. No pets. Lock all doors. No drugs on premises. The air reeked of mildew and stale food smells. The doorway, a doorway opened from the foyer to a long, dark hall. This way, Waldo said, plunging into the darkness. Watch your step. The fucking light's been out forever. He led Bill to a door with a crudely painted nine on it, fumbled with his keys in the darkness, unlocked the door, and then stepped aside to let Bill pass. This is home, Bill, Waldo said, flicking on an overhead light. Street light drizzled into the room through a pair of dust streaked windows. In an alcove, half concealed by a curtain, was an unmade bed. He glimpsed a toilet in a tiny bathroom off the short entrance hall. A couch covered with a pink chenille bedspread, a little vinyl-topped kitchen table with two chairs, a scattering of orange crates stuffed with books and albums, and an old hi-fi completed the decor of the main room, which was no bigger than Bill's Eden Plains bedroom. Cockroaches scampered across the counter of the galley kitchen at their approach. The sink was crammed with dirty pots, dishes, cups, and glasses. The air smelled of perfume and garbage. Are you hungry? Waldo asked. Yeah. Sit down. I made some chicken dumpling soup. I'll grab you a bowl. The soup? served in a chip bowl was the best thing Bill had eaten since before he'd gone to the hospital. The broth was rich and the dumplings fluffy. Waldo watched him eat a glass of wine in front of him. So where are you from? Illinois, a little town. I'm from Nebraska myself, Waldo said conversationally. Bet my town was littler. So Pete said you had to leave because the folks figured out you were gay. Bill mumbled in embarrassed, yeah. Honey, you're not the first. This city is filled with boys like you and me. Bill lifted his eyes from the bowl. You too? Waldo nodded, yeah, me too. My sophomore year, a bunch of boys got me behind the bleachers, made me suck their dicks, and then beat the shit out of me. He grinned. Well, I didn't mind sucking the dicks, but I didn't like how they rearranged my pretty face. When I told my folks what happened, they said it was my fault for being a faggot and threw me out. He studied Bill. You're not a queen like me. How did your folks find out? My dad caught me with a friend. Waldo asked thoroughly, was your dick in his mouth or his in yours? Lightheaded with fatigue, Bill laughed and Waldo laughed with him. They laughed until tears came, and then they wiped them away, and Bill asked if he could have another bowl of soup. As Waldo served him, he said, you know, we're the lucky ones. We made it out alive. Not all of us do. 
Waldo had become had begun to come into focus for Bill as a real person. He no longer merely saw the bouffant hair and mascara, the limp wrists and tight clothes, which in any event Waldo had exchanged for a silk kimono. Out of those affectations, a boy had emerged with kind eyes and a smirk of a smile. Bill relaxed. I was giving Marco a blowjob when my dad found us. He said he beat me up bad. When I got out of the hospital, my mom drove me to the bus station. With nothing but the clothes on your back, those fuckers. I left my suitcase at the bus station. I have a little money. You can get your suitcase tomorrow and bring it here. Waldo gulped down a sob and managed to strangle. Thank you. He wiped his eyes. I don't know what I'm going to do. Waldo smiled. You're going to finish your soup, then we'll make up the catch and you'll get some sleep. A key turned and the door opened. An older black man in a rumpled uniform came yawning into the room. He smiled sleepily at the two boys at the table. We doing a three-way, he asked Waldo. Bill's just crashing here. Hey, Bill, this is my lover, Eddie. Um, hello, Bill said, adding a respectful, sir. Eddie laughed. Sir, how old do you think I am, boy? I'm going to shower, baby boy, then I'm going to bed. Sure thing, doll, Waldo replied. I'll be waiting for you. When the shower went on, Bill asked Waldo, um, does Eddie live here too? Waldo smirked. No, hon. Eddie lives with his wife and kids over in the Fillmore. A couple of times a week, he tells her he's pulling overtime and he comes by to fuck me senseless. Bill, not knowing how else to respond, said, Okay. Waldo said, you looked at him like you would never seen a black guy before. There aren't too many at Eden Plains. You prejudiced against them? Um, my dad doesn't like them. Waldo nodded. Betty calls them niggers, just like my dad. Well, let me tell you something, Bill. You're one of them now. One of what? He asked, confused. A nigger, hun. We're all the same. Queers, niggers, spicks, chinks. All in the same boat, because the same people hate all of us. So we got to stick together, okay? Bill, still uncomprehending, nodded. Let's make up your bed. Just toss the bowl in the sink with the other shit. The maid will take care of it. You have a maid? Waldo laughed. Child, you are a stitch. Later, Bill lay sleepless in the lumpy couch, trying not to hear the muffled sex sounds drifting into the room from behind the curtain alcove. It wasn't so much the whispered, oh yeah, fuck me, daddy, fuck me, that kept him awake as the low rumble of Eddie's laughter and Waldo's happy squeals. Fun. They were having fun. Fun, he realized, had never entered into his fantasies. Okay. So thank you all for coming.